life is that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Well, it's good that it's quiet. Because this is not something to shout and holler about and to think this is really a fun game to play. We'll read it again. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. The early Christians bore about in their body his death because it was as though people were striking out against him, which is what they were doing. We saw it in Acts 9. He was breathing out threatenings against the Lord's disciples, and then Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now this, I hope, will be a tape you hear over and over and over again, so that whenever the last days come fully upon us and you are suffering physically for his namesake, remember what Paul said. But you're called as a Christian to bear in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Oh, it's more than anyone that I've ever heard before can handle. All charismatic teachers lumped together included. They would never, never come to a verse like this and really tell us what it meant. Because of the fear of ever having to fulfill that in their own life. Why sometimes, we could ask, why sometimes is it that after you've been in the faith for a while and you claim your healing based on the word of God, 1 Peter 2.24, by whose stripes I was healed, and yet you go for the next week with your body still hurting, how will you ever know whether you really believe the promise, really believe the promise <laughs> that you are healed, unless sometimes you don't feel like it? How will you ever know that you are a Christian committed to Jesus Christ and nothing can turn you away until you have blood dripping from the wound, wounds of someone striking you? How will you ever really know? Otherwise, Christianity remains the great profession. Everyone professes Christianity, but no one practices it. And no one lives it. Well, as I said, people have seen me in dream and vision, what I'm going to have to be suffering for his name's sake in his stead in the last day. And it's something I don't take lightly, and it's something to consider whenever all those little things come along your way that you think are so big and so great. When yet verse 11 has not even partially been fulfilled, when Paul said, we which live are always delivered unto death, always. And yet we could say that we which live are rarely delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. For Paul, it was all the time. Just time and time again, the suffering and the reproach and the reviling that he experienced. Look over in chapter 11, verse 23. We mentioned in an earlier message, it's too bad that more is not required of candidates for the ministry than just a year of hopscotch Bible school. Whereas a lot of the people and the, the priests and so forth and the false religions, the Eastern mystic cults, have to endure years and years of hardship before they're counted worthy to be a minister of Buddha or whoever. Are they ministers of Christ? Are these charismatic people out there, are they really ministers of Christ? I don't think that they are. I don't really think that they are. I don't really think that they are, and I really don't think that they are. Are they ministers of Christ? Paul says, I am more. 
and laborers more abundant. What do they do? Just jet set around the world. Rarely have to labor in anything. One brother here in the church told me a number of years ago, another minister that he was had listened to at that time, said that he had gotten, you know, so wise or so bright or something. He said, I only have to study two hours a day now. You know, I've worked my way down from ten hours a day down to two hours a day. All I've got to do, a minister, a teacher of the Word of God, a self-professed, anyway, minister of Christ, who said, I labor for two hours a day and studies the rest of the day. I have fun counseling people. People like to just sit around and counsel. You get to meet new people and talk about different psychological subjects and just have fun. Paul says, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. There should have been a limit to these stripes. There should have been a measure, but I've gone above it, whatever that measure was. In prisons more frequent, in deaths all. Maybe, just maybe, non-charismatic Christians behind the iron and bamboo curtains will really have a greater reward in the kingdom of God than spirit-filled believers here in this country. Maybe, maybe that's going to be true. Amen. Who have suffered for the name of Jesus. Who maybe don't believe in divine healing. Who maybe don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But who have suffered for Jesus' sake. And yet charismatic, spirit-filled people in this country don't suffer anything. If you attempt to point them in the area of suffering, they'll flee your church. Or if you try to bring some suffering on them, they'll sue you. One way or the other, they'll get out of it. So maybe those, I know it's true. And your heart has to go out to those behind the iron and the bamboo curtain who suffer just because they say, I am a Christian. I mean, there is profession, but there is more than a profession when you know that you're going to suffer if you say that. Amen. Where in this country, you suffer if you don't say that. You have to say, I'm a Christian, to be accepted in society out there, to be thought of as a moral and ethical individual. And yet in those countries, Christianity is a great profession, but it's a great way of life as well. And if you're a true believer, and then the mind wants to work logically, well, if I tell them no, then they'll leave me alone and I can go on and preach the gospel some more. Does the end ever justify the means? Wouldn't God be more pleased with me lying to them, telling them, no, I'm not a Christian, with my fingers crossed behind my back. God knows that I'm really a Christian. God knows. Does he really? It's in my heart. He really knows. I'm going to tell them no because it makes a lot of sense. And it does. It makes a lot of sense. Just perverted human sense, though. It makes a lot of sense. If I tell them no, if I tell that Soviet guard there at the border, no, I'm not a Christian. I'm not coming into the country to preach the gospel. If I tell him no, he'll let me in. He won't put me in prison. And I can just teach the word everywhere. Wouldn't God be more pleased with that? No. He's pleased when you fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ. Amen. What if that means I, I don't even get to preach my first sermon? Well, they almost killed Jesus after he taught his first one. That's right. Almost, but not quite. So that wouldn't be anything strange for you to experience. And after all, why didn't God just let Paul go on and live to be 165? instead of just 65. Think how many more epistles we could have. we probably have some to Laodicea, some real ones to Laodicea, still around today. Smyrna would have some to Smyrna, would have some to Philadelphia. Paul would have got around to writing them just like John did. All of the letters, we have, all the people that could have been saved under his ministry. Why did he let him die when he's 65? Why not live? Why didn't Paul just say, no, I'm not a Christian Caesar? Caesar would have known that he was lying. But no, I'm not a Christian, and go out and preach another 20 years. It just doesn't work that way. Amen. Of the Jews, verse 24, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Beaten. Beaten for the faith. What about the early martyrs that we've had some of you read about who were burned at the stake for their beliefs? I was thinking of that even last night as I stood out burning some things in an old barrel, watched the fire just leap out of that, and it leaps out and you leap away because it's hot. And you talk about these things, stripes, 
You almost have to go to a jail cell or go to another country and watch them with their flogging exercise of someone in public to really get it in your heart of what he's talking about. We're not just reading verse here, Jews five times three die forty stripes, save one. He means beatings with a whip, a cat of nine tails. It just opens your flesh like laying a fish, filleting a fish. It's easy to read it, but then now let me think about what does it mean to receive five times of the Jews, 40 stripes save one. What does it mean to be burned at the stake for my faith? Well, start a big bonfire. Just get as close as you can to it. Don't commit suicide. You won't go to heaven then. Get as close as you can to it. And then think, now, what would I be doing if I were in the middle of that bound to a stake? Would you be just screaming or yelling or saying, as he did, as he told us to do in Matthew 5, rejoice. Would you be rejoicing in Jesus? This is a, a church emptying message. You empty the pews with teaching like this. I hope it won't happen here. We prepared you for it before. But we're just teaching you the word of God. This isn't an extra biblical private revelation that I got. It's right out of the word of God. It's right out of the experience of countless martyrs through the centuries Amen. who gave up their life because of the faith. Instead of doing what most people do, I gave up the faith because of my life. I don't want to die. He calls us to give up our life for the faith, and they tell us, give up the faith because of your life. Here's rods. Thrice was I beaten with rods. He doesn't mean a spanking on the posterior. He means a beating. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Go watch someone beat their old hound dog. You shouldn't be doing that. Maybe you can find a neighbor who does, who just lays the hound dog open with a rod. That's what he's talking about, beating. Once was I stoned. Well, he talks about that over in chapter 14 of the book of Acts. Luke does. Once was I stoned. Rocks. Rocks thrown at you. You know, you have a little bitty pebble that shoots out from underneath a lawnmower, and it really stings when it hits. What about boulders being thrown at you? You say, well, it probably would kill you. It did him. It probably would. You don't generally survive very many stonings. You generally don't survive any. <laughs> Paul didn't. God had to raise him from the dead. Acts chapter 14. We'll see how Luke paints the picture. Maybe we'll grasp it better here. Get an old barrel this afternoon outside and get boulders, and you and your wife just chunk boulders at it. <laughs> now, I'm serious. It's the only way you really can come to grips with what these things are here, suffering Amen. for his namesake. Amen. And think, now, what would it feel like if I were there? Would I be dodging them? Would I be covering up my head? That's the last thing I want him to hit because that'll kill me. Or would you be saying that, well, if I lived, it would be great, but if I died, it'd be far better. Or you could even tell him, hit me with your best shot. Because it'd bring death quickly and I'd go to be with him. Acts chapter 14. Verse 19, there came thither certain Jews. Paul's gone in a very short space, verse 12 to verse 19, from being praised as a god to killed as a martyr. All in just a few verses. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persecuted the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, you know, like a sack of potatoes behind you drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. Paul tells us, we just read the verses in 2 Corinthians, that he was dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city. The next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. One thing you can be certain of is that if it's not your time to go, that if you do die, God will raise you from the dead. You can be certain of that. If it's not your time to go, you don't need to protect yourself. He'll raise you from the dead. He does to Paul. Paul gets killed later on. God doesn't raise him from the dead then. Not the final time. Other times, he said of death's oft, he does, but not the last time. There's a time to stay. There's a time to go. And when there comes a time to go, there's nothing you can do about it. And you might not know whether it's your time to go or not.
Well, how does this all tie in? You say to, I'm confessing I'll never die. Well, that doesn't mean you won't be beaten with a whip five times with 40 stripes save one. That doesn't kill a person. It can. Sometimes it did. That doesn't mean you won't experience that. And even if you do die, he can always raise you from the dead so that you still get to go out as one not having died. John chapter 8 and verse 51. Hebrews 2, around verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> so, back to 2 Corinthians 11. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. Not I missed the plane like some charismatic teachers have. I'm suffering because I missed my flight. No, he didn't miss the flight. The whole flight went down. I didn't miss my boat. The boat had a wreck, and I was on the boat. And as a result, they had to fish me out after spending a night and a day in the deep. A night and a day just floating around the Mediterranean Sea. God, what am I doing out here? I can't preach to anyone except the fish that swim by and nibble at my feet. People cry out, Lord, what am I doing here? What's your purpose in this? Maybe it's to show you what you're made of. And journeyings often. Now, he doesn't mean traveling like charismatics because they didn't just hop in a Cadillac or on a plane and take off. To take a journey was a difficult thing. It was very difficult. So the, his journeyings often, we couldn't compare to the journeyings often of in and out fly-by-night charismatic teachers. Perils of waters, perils of robbers. Paul must have been robbed on occasion as he was out traveling. He had to have been. He put into practice then Luke 6, whenever they took his goods, he didn't ask for them again. He just gives us a scenario of events, but doesn't give us a complete picture of everything that he ever experienced in his life. Maybe after they took all of his food, then supernaturally he spoke to rocks and they gave him water and ravens brought him bread. The Bible's not going to tell us every miracle that ever happened. But he somehow made it because he lived to write about it. It's one way you know that things are going your way when you live to write about your persecutions. Perils of robbers and perils of mine own countrymen. Ever had your own countrymen? You know, people in your own family give you any perils in your life? Perils. In the last days, the children will betray the fathers and mothers to death, Jesus said in Matthew 10. Brother, the brother, the sister, the sister, the parents, the children, the children, the parents will betray them to death. In perils of the heathen, the he means now Gentiles. His countrymen would be Jews and the heathen would be Gentiles. Perils in the city, perils out of the city. It doesn't matter where I go. I can go in town, I can go out of town. I still get perils. Perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. Well, we can say that we've had our share of that for sure. Perils among false brethren, false brethren, in weariness and painfulness. Sometimes he must have hurt in some of his physical persecutions and watchings often, in hunger and thirst in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. But yet Paul is not the one, after writing stuff like this, who'd sing those little songs that maybe some of the ones behind the Iron Curtain do and, and other people sing whenever they have little problems, things like, oh, Jesus knows best, he knows best, I'm, I'm suffering, but he knows best. No, Paul would be singing things like, he gives me the victory seven days a week. Paul would be singing things like that. Amen. Not, oh, why does it have to happen to me? But Jesus knows best, after all. That's a great distinction that, that you need to realize because people talk about, well, these other people have suffered. Well, how did, they, how did they look on their sufferings, though? Did they look on them in victory like Paul did? Most of them didn't. A whole lot of them didn't. Paul looked on his sufferings in victory. Paul would be going through his sufferings, but, well, we see it over in Acts chapter 16. He's singing in the prison and rejoicing at the same time. Oh, yeah. And he's not singing little songs about, well, God knows best. 
Like, well, I don't know what's going on, but God knows best. He likes us to be sick and poor so we can be humble all our life. No, that's not Paul's concept or mentality at all. He'd be saying, thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Jesus Christ. That's what he'd be singing. So you can be going through identical sufferings or you can have verse 24 be receiving some of those stripes and then not view your sufferings in the way that you should. That's why we're teaching you these things. So that when they happen, you'll view them in the right way. And you'll go through them not feeling sorry or anything like that. You'll go through them. He gives me the victory seven days a week. And yet just to say he gives me the victory doesn't mean I'm not ever going to have persecutions in my life. He said, I'm going to have victory, not an absence of persecutions. They can't be equated. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the spiritual care, those things that are without are all these things that hurt me physically. There's another type of suffering. That which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the assemblies. Of being concerned about the saints at Corinth because they're misunderstanding things and rumors are being spread about Paul and Peter and Apollos and then the Christ party and about adultery and fornication and incest and all these things. That was a great weight and load upon his mind to have to be thinking about these things all the time and try to get them straightened out in the lives of the people. And then he writes, and it's a blessing when the people at Thessalonica receive his first epistle, but then they misunderstand and they stop working and he has to write another epistle. <laughs> the care of all the churches. You find it in all of his epistles. In Hebrews, he's got a group of people who are, at least in the back of their mind, considering giving up the Christian faith and going back to Mosaic legalistic Judaism. That's a weight on Paul's mind. Not only, you know, you would think it's enough to be beaten and stoned and put in jail. But while you're in jail, while you're being beaten and stoned, then all these other thoughts, now if I die, who's going to ever straighten out the Corinthians? The care, the weight of all the other people. And it can be a great weight to have. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern my weaknesses. Now, he doesn't mean that he's weak in anything. Just he's talking about what he's just been experiencing here. People even translate it sickness. I'm glorying because I'm sick. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. He escaped if he could. He didn't just say persecute me so I can be an overcomer. If he could get out of it, he could. But here's the place where he couldn't. Verses 23 through 28. Or he would have gotten out of them. But here he does escape in the end of the chapter and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escape their hands. All right, now let's go back and look where we start in Philippians 1.29. And hopefully the day star has arisen in your heart by now. Amen. Light in the word of God so you know what we're talking about. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake. We're not a pessimistic group. We have an optimistic outlook on everything. Amen. Amen. But we know that this world is going down. Amen. And we know that the word of God is going to be fulfilled or the people of God are going to suffer reproach for his name. Who else is a candidate for that except a group like ours? No one else is willing to suffer for his name. The word of God is going to be fulfilled by someone. Through thick and thin, come what may, the word of God is going to be fulfilled. Somebody who belongs to Jesus is going to suffer for his sake. It's not going to be the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the Catholics or the Presbyterians. It won't be them because they'll give up the faith before they give up their life. Amen. They won't be, as it said of the overcomers in Revelation chapter 12, and they love not their lives unto the death. Amen. That's true of an overcomer. Amen. That's true of one who has a deep understanding of what his Christianity is all about. 
which some people behind the Iron Curtain have. It's because you get to practice the things that you have been taught and the things that maybe you teach yourself. You get to practice those things. So be they an overcomer or not really is beside the point. They have a deep understanding of what God requires of them as a child of his to stand up for what they believe and for Jesus Christ. And it will be true of them as well, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that they love not their lives unto the death. Sometimes it's a literal death. Sometimes it's as though you died. Many of those occasions there in 2 Corinthians 11, we could say Paul loved not his life unto the death because how do you know whether that experience at that time is going to kill you or not? You don't know. You don't know whether you're going to die or not unless you have a revelation. So in every case, whether you die or not, it's not the point. It's that you love not your life unto the thought of death or unto the experience if that's the case that it eventually comes. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake. Paul suffered for his sake. We would be doing you a disservice not to enlighten you of these things and prepare you for them in advance. Amen. Because you wouldn't know what to do whenever you were in the experience. What are we going to do when someone comes and Oh, someone has to carry them in. They're bleeding and bruised, and they just say, I want to give a testimony. Someone part of this church, I want to give a testimony. Well, their actions speak louder than the words. They don't need to give a testimony. We know what it's all about already. We know what it's about. What are we going to do when you see some brother or sister here in this church that you love and appreciate come in like that? I hope you don't feel sorry for them. hope you rejoice that they have a great reward in heaven. Praise God. Amen. I don't rejoice in the sense that, as Paul says, I weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Sometimes you can just be so exuberant in your rejoicing that you really don't consider the depth of what a person has gone through. Sometimes it's not time to rejoice right then, but be with the person. As Paul says, we read it there in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, we were comforted by God so that we can comfort others when they're going through the same things that we're going through. And then he, the very next verse goes on to say that as we live, then we have the sufferings of Christ in us. We all come here and meet. We're not forbidden by the authorities, not yet anyway, to meet. Not threatened if we meet here. Most of us haven't been threatened if we gather together in the name of Jesus. But what's going to happen when something like that does occur? When your wife, your husband... Your husband, your pastor, what if I were locked up in prison for 20 years? What are you going to do then? Have you ever thought of that? Maybe some of you have. What are you going to do for the next 20 years? There's no guarantee that I'm never going to be locked up in prison. There's no guarantee of that at all. There are more guarantees that just the opposite is going to be true. So are you ready? Are you prepared? Is that going to shake your foundation so that the church just falls apart? Most churches, if their leader ever leaves, just fall apart. It shows the church was really no good after all. If the church can't outlive, I can say it this way, the existence of its leader or its founder, it's not worth existing at all then. If it can't outlive the existence of its leader or founder. Christianity couldn't just curl up and die because its founder, Jesus, died or because its chief propagator, Paul, was martyred. Christianity couldn't just curl up under a rug and die. It showed how valid and, and powerful a force it really was when it just continued to grow. It grew through persecution. It grew. It didn't shrink. It grew through persecution. And now today, the only way that we can ever grow is through denominational merger. That's the way people grow today, is through denominational mergers, not through the experience of persecution. Next Sunday, you come, and there's no one in the pulpit. What are you going to do? <laughs> well, we'll all go to the jail and have church there then. Well, <laughs> maybe they'd let us, maybe they wouldn't. Visiting rights for, you know, these out 
lawed criminals maybe are just only for relatives. Well, you can claim we're all family then. We're all brothers and sisters. <laughs> I don't think that's going to hold much water, though. It might sound like pessimism, but it's not. It's just facing the facts of, as I said, reality and revelation. The Word of God, it's, it's been demonstrated in the past that these things are true, and the Word of God says that it's going to continue to be true. I don't think we've ever taught a message like this before. We've taught on this subject before, but never like this. For the I don't think we've ever taught a message like this before. We've taught on this subject before, but never like this. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 24. Paul's rejoicing. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind, that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. What would Jesus be experiencing if he were living in the day when the first chapter of the book of Colossians was written? Persecution by religious leaders. It would have been the same thing. They would still be attempting to kill him. They would still be reviling, buffeting him, making a mockery of him and of his ministry. Luke 4, physician, heal thyself. When he's on the cross, if you be the Son of God, then come down and we'll believe you. Making a mockery of such sacred, sacred matters. People are going to be judged who make a mockery of this church and this ministry. Who make a mockery of such sacred things as the things that we are involved in here. Who never take the time or the courtesy to check out their accusations who level all types of statements against us that aren't even true of our insincerity and a whole lot of other things. And all you'd have to do is come to this church and you know that we are sincere. We might be wrong, but at least we're sincere in what we believe here. And yet we've had all types of things leveled against us that aren't even true. And they just make a mockery of all the noise that we make here in our praise, make a mockery of such sacred, sacred matters. They are going to be judged. I was doing some correspondence with a certain group of people in the state of Illinois recently concerning persecution that another body has been receiving. And I got some response from them yesterday. And a group who doesn't hold to the things that we do, but whom I have been in contact with, and they informed me of what happened they explain it away, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying, so let me say this right now, I'm not saying that it's valid or it's not valid. I'm just reporting the facts to you right now, that after a paper in Indiana came out with all types of, of malicious remarks and reports against a local church there in Indiana, right after that, uh, that series of articles came out, then in that little town, not a big town there where that paper was based, and not a violent town like big Chicago or Gary, Indiana is or something, but shortly thereafter, the editor of that paper and his whole family was brutally murdered. And it came, that happened right after the series of articles that came out against that church. Brutally murdered. He and his whole family were slaughtered by some madman. Well, you can call it judgment of God or not. It's up to you. But I know what the Word of God says if you want to look over in the book of Psalms. The 105th one. The 14th and the 15th verse. He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Amen. You might not agree with us. You might not agree with me. I wouldn't criticize me if I were you. No. I wouldn't. That's right. I wouldn't. You might not understand all that goes on at this church or whatever. Outsiders might not understand, but you're a wise man. If you, with, 
if you withhold yourself and refrain from criticism on unfounded bases when you don't know what's going on. You're a wise man because most people don't. They criticize that that they know not. They know nothing about what's going on and still make a mockery of it. What is our prayer? Our prayer is that God will forgive them because they do it in ignorance. They don't know what they're doing. Our prayer isn't a threat of God's judgment over them. He gets to give those threats. We don't. Romans 12, give place to vengeance. Sometimes you'd like to have some vengeance. Well, give place to it whenever you feel like having vengeance towards someone who's done something wrong to you or to this ministry or to this church and what we stand for and believe and teach. Give place to it. God says that vengeance is mine, Romans 12, and I will repay. Amen. I will repay. No, our prayer is, is what we find over in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60. Amen. Stephen kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know what? Sometimes God will lay it to their charge anyway. He wants to find out what you're made of. You show what you're made of by praying a prayer like that as your last prayer. Well, that just may be a prayer that doesn't get answered. It's going to have results because it shows that you're walking in the deeper life in the Spirit. But that just may be a prayer that's not according to the will of God, and therefore it won't be answered. When God will lay that sin to their charge. What about over in Matthew? I'll show you where it does happen. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24 and verse 25. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, all the Jewish people, all the Jewish people, his blood be on us and on our children. Now, there's a prayer I think did get answered. The blood of the Nazarene is to this day on the hands of the Jews. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and that's why there is a veil over their eyes when they read the word of God. Read the Old Testament. They can't see their Messiah in great passages like uh, Psalm 110 that Jesus said proves. There are two lords back there. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. There are two lords there. Yet the Jews, oh, the great Shema, Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, their same Bible says they're two lords. Genesis chapter 19, around verse 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah fire and brimstone out of the Lord, which was in heaven. Two lords again. Genesis 1, 26 to 27, let us make man in Amen. our image. Can the Jews see that? Not on your life, nor on theirs. I remember my wife had a former employee many, many years ago when she was working at a store down in Texas who was a Jew, kindly, kindly old man and his wife. And after we got married, I just, I took out pen and paper and wrote him a long letter. I just showed him all of those things. I showed him all those passages. So said, I can prove to you, although you think that you understand Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, you really don't. The Lord our God is one Lord because I can show you not from my Bible, which is New Testament, I can show you from your Bible that there are two Lords, at least two, plurality of them in the Old Testament. Couldn't see that for anything. I showed him. He said, look in your Bible. Don't trust my Bible. I didn't write my version, but don't trust it anyway. Look in your Bible. Didn't, couldn't find it. Looked right at the passages, never did see it. That's a prayer that got fulfilled in Matthew 27. His blood be upon us. What I'm saying is it's going to happen for those who are reviling us because it's not us. Acts 9 says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? If you know someone who's threatened the church, pray for them. Because they're in a precarious, slippery situation. They have no guarantee that that car won't go off the 100-foot embankment next week. Does God do things like that? Read Numbers 
chapter 16. Go home and read Numbers 16. See whether or not God does things like that. When people touch the anointed of the Lord. Oh, but he's not anointed. Well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. We'll find out one day. We'll find out. I wouldn't run around saying that until I was certain about that. That he's not God's anointed, so it's all right to touch him. Because there are a group of people who thought Moses was not the Lord's anointed, or at least thought that he took too much upon himself. Remember Korah, his group, number 16? Yeah. Ye take too much upon yourself, seeing that all of the Lord's people are holy. Who do you think you are always knowing everything and saying everything? All of us are holy out here. <laughs> do you know what happened to them? Earthquake opened, swallowed them up. Fire burned in their midst and consumed some of them. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing. That's something that we should all remind ourselves of. Let's don't go home today and have the pastor for dinner. And you know what I mean by that. People talk about having the pastor for dinner. We'll have him over. No, they have him for dinner every Sunday. Did you hear what he said? I don't agree with that. I'll tell you what I think about that. Here's a piece of my mind. And after every service, you have the pastor over for dinner. And you eat him rather than feed him. So don't go home and do that today. Oh, he told me about all this suffering. I don't want to go through all of that. We're just reading you what the word of God says. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the assembly. Paul says he gives us a revelation here in verse 26, a mystery. It's hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to the saints through him, not through anyone else, through Paul, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have so much to look forward to. There is so much, so much in the area of eternal blessings that these things should be thought of as only something small and something that is only but for a moment, as, again, we've shown you from Second Corinthians. So it's Christ, Paul says, whom we preach, warning, warning every man. Is church supposed to be a place of warning? Well, evidently so. Warning and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, there's the labor again, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Oh, I thought it was pretty interesting when I found out from these people that the editor and his family brutally slaughtered and murdered by a madman. Evidently just for being associated with the town maybe the whole town will have tornadoes through it but at least the paper that was responsible whether he was or not the paper that was responsible for the reports that brought so much additional persecution on that church that didn't need any more they had their share anyway a lot of people wouldn't have known anything about what was going on if that newspaper would have kept their nose out of something that was none of their business Amen. but the news media makes a job at making everything their business Amen. Even the news media itself now, back when we used to watch TV, I saw there were several forums and debates with some of the leaders on. The news media itself is concerned about itself in getting into the private affairs of people. On these cases where an airplane goes down and a loved one loses all of their family in the plane and then they come to the side and what happens? Someone sticks a microphone in there. What do you think about it? Yeah. <laughs> you just lost your husband, your children, your grandparents. You just lost everyone, and some fool of the world sticks a microphone to your face and says, well, what do you think about it? A person ought to be shocked that does something like that when a person's in a time of grief and suffering after an experience like that. And even the news media itself is concerned about itself. They're not going to change, though. They're not concerned to the point of changing anything. They ought to be outlawed. The old Antichrist constitution of this country is just that, an Antichrist system and document that gives everyone freedom of speech and freedom of whatever you want to write, freedom of press. 
You can write whatever you want to write, say whatever you want to say. That's an antichrist. That's just like the devil. Everyone do your own thing. It's like the days of the judges. There was no king. No one told us what to do. No one led us. No one guided us with good right laws. There was no king in Israel in those days, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's all our constitution is. There's a book of judges over it. No one leads us or guides us. You can say what you want to. You can believe what you want to. You can write what you want to. We have freedom of religion. We really don't if you believe like we believe. But if you don't, you can believe anything you want to believe. And yet we're a Christian country. Well, let, let, let us tell you that. This is founded on godly principles. But in order to be godly principles, it has to be free. It's fallen humanity's desire to do his thing, to do what he wants to do, to do what's convenient to do what his pleasure is, to do what feels good. But they're not going to change. You watch them and see. And even some in medical science, they're concerned about the drugs they're administering to people because they're having adverse side effects that they're not supposed to have. Well, they'll take those off the market and put five more on. That's all that happens. It's rare whenever they pull a drug off the market. It's not supposed to get on there anyway when it kills people and causes all types of deformations in, in children that are born. Well, it's just going to continue to get worse. It's going to continue to get worse. But we've got something to look forward to. Turn over to Titus. We might as well close on an optimistic note. Titus 2 and verse 12. teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Praise the Lord. You may just find out that even watching the news on TV ends up being for you a worldly lust, a carnal desire to hear it the way they have to say it. I just don't have that desire anymore. I got delivered from that. Hallelujah. And it is, it is something to be delivered from. Amen. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Paul calls it in Galatians 1.4 this present evil world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise thee. Paul says we're looking for the glorious appearing, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Who's going to deliver us? out of all of whatever we're experiencing at that time and bring us into what we have over in Revelation chapter 21. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and he that sat upon the throne said behold i make all things new and he said unto me write for these words are true and faithful and he said unto me it is done i am alpha and omega the beginning and the end i will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, liars who deny their Christianity while their fingers are crossed behind their back, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Now unto him that is able to keep, able to keep you from falling, and present you always before the presence of his glory with exceeding.
for a com 